Grace to you and peace from Almighty God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We welcome all of you to the service of worship this morning. This is Boy Scout Sunday. It is also the Super Bowl of Caring Sunday, and that's S-O-U-P-E-R, Super Bowl of Caring. And so this morning in your bulletin, you have a community assistance ministry envelope. If you would like to, to put money into the, the envelope for our own pantry, that will go to serve the Super Bowl of Caring numbers. I would encourage you, rather than putting your envelope in the bulletin, in the offering, hold it, and at the kids at the very end of the service, our teenagers will be back there with two, bowl, two uh, pots. You can put it either in the Atlanta Falcons uh, pot or else in the one that says uh, New England Patriots. So one or the other, make your vote, and we'll let you know next week how things go with that. Um, the green insert in your bulletin this morning is worth noting. You'll find it, and it's an opportunity for all church members to participate in an information-only gathering, which will be on February 26th, uh, Sunday afternoon at 430 about the organ and about the, the possible options that are available for us with the organ, we'll hear the report of the task force. If you would like to attend, you're most welcome. There are gonna be essentially the session and three committees that need to be there, but anyone else is certainly welcome to come. If you would like to participate in the light supper afterwards at 5.30, fill this form out and we'll know how many to plan for for the meal. On Wednesday night, there will be no adult Bible study this week. Um, I'll be preparing to go to Guatemala very early the next morning, so um, be packing up at the same time. But we will start a uh, series on uh, March 1st, an adult Bible study on a Lenten series on Jesus and material possessions. And certainly we want to encourage anyone who would like to be part of that from 5 to 5.45 and dinner following that. The fallow is coming up. It is our opportunity to celebrate the Edict of Emancipation. I saw printed this week in one of our publications the Emancipation Proclamation. That's, we're not celebrating Lincoln. We're celebrating the fallow and the Edict emancipation of the Waldensians. So that will be February 18th, 6.30 at the winery. Francis Rivers will be speaking that evening and will be preaching here that Sunday. Now let us prepare our hearts for the worship of Almighty God.
You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? You are the light of the world. The city upon a hill cannot be hid. Let your light shine before others. So that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let us worship God. sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins god who is merciful and just will forgive us and grant us forgiveness let us pray together the prayer of confession we confess that we cling to the world we know we are comfortable in our own past cherishing memories of those things we know we confess that we put comfort ahead of almost anything we do not want our world to change too much. We confess that we are often frightened of change. We do not want the present order to change so much that we cannot recognize it. We confess, Lord, that we are afraid of the change you might bring into our lives. We come asking for the love that not only brings the changes we need, but also the love that conquers our fear. We pray for this in the name of Jesus. 
who has turned the world upside down. Amen. Let us pray together in silent uh, confession to God. mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel, for in Jesus Christ we are all forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives us our sins keep and abide us in eternal life, now and forever. Amen. store and they were giving out samples to get you to taste it hopefully that you'll buy it okay well I've got I've got some food here that I want you to taste okay the first is it's popcorn and Alex would you let them just just a little bit I just want you to taste it okay that's the first that's the first batch okay Good? Okay. Okay. 
Taste that first. Okay. So that, that's pretty good? Okay, well then taste this. Okay? I want you to taste this and tell me which one you like best. Is there anyone here that's allergic to nuts? No. No? No. Okay. And then I have something else I want you to taste. Okay. These are pecans. I want you to taste this one. Okay. Taste this one. Well, that's what I want, that's what I want you to taste those. And then I want you to taste these. Come on in. You want to taste them? You taste them. Mmm? Pretty good? And then taste these. What did you notice that between... Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> what did you notice between the two? Between the first two popcorn, the, between the first popcorn and the second popcorn. And what else? Style. Um, what did you notice between the uh, first uh, pecans and the second pecans? Huh? The first ones weren't salted and the second ones were. So which ones did you like best? The first ones. <laughs> So will you agree with me that a little bit of salt makes it better? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, you know what? I'll agree with you. In today's lesson, in today's Bible lesson, you know what? Jesus actually says to his, his excuse me, to that Jesus says to his disciples that you are the salt of the earth. It comes from Matthew uh, chapter 5. What do you think he meant by that? What do you think he meant? He said, you are the salt of the earth. Because we're made. Well, we are, but what do you think he meant when he told his disciples, you are the salt of the earth? What did that salt do to the food? It made it better. It made it better. So what do you think he was telling his disciples? That's right. You make it better. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to say. He said, you know, you can make things better through knowing me. So when you go out into the world and take Jesus with you, you can make other people's lives better by showing them his love. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Okay, there he is. Heavenly Father, our Father, uh, our prayer is that we may be the salt of the earth by showing the love of Jesus in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> If you have a student with you in first through fifth grade, they're welcome to join us in the children's hour. If you do have that student going out for the children's hour, you can pick them up in Pioneer Hall today. Also, this is an opportunity for us. We have had a relationship with Boy Scout Troop 192 for over 80 years, about 84 years. We've also developed a new relationship with Cub Scout Pack. 192 in the last few years and so 
uh, representatives of both are welcome to come forward and share with us just a minute or two about what's going on in their programs. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, good to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, there are some of you I probably don't know. Uh, but my name is Todd Blackwell. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of <clears throat> Valdez and I've been involved with um, Troop 192 for one or two years. I uh, earned my Eagle Scout while I was a Boy Scout and then later on I served as um, uh, a li liaison and uh, now I've been somehow rodeoed into being Scoutmaster. Uh, I'm glad that we don't have time for uh, Mr. Bonner behind me to regale you with stories. But um, I'm very excited to uh, be in this new role. I've only been in the role for um, a couple of months. As you can see, I don't, I don't quite have my uniform right yet. Um, Ms. Bonner let me know that Scout Sunday was coming up today, but the pants that I got didn't fit, so we're working on it. Um, we are, uh, uh, we're in a pretty good spot. I've got, um, uh, they, they kind of threw me into the fire. I have two kids. Um, that uh, are up for board of review for their Eagle later this month and um, have another one that is working hard to get there. Uh, so we're excited about that. And I wanna talk a little bit, you know, when my, when my parents were growing up, there were not, uh, there, there was lots of other things to do besides Boy Scouts, but there was not nearly the competition for time and interest um, that kids face today. So I wanted to say something real quick about that. Uh, one is to the kids in the audience, if there are any that didn't go to children's church, um, I hope you would consider participating in Boy Scouts because we're going to do a lot of stuff in the outdoors and have a tremendous amount of fun and I am I'm really looking forward to being involved in that part of it. Um, but I also want to say something to parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, you know, why should you talk to um, uh, the boys in your family about considering giving scouting a shot? And um, a couple things real quick, one is um, uh, I'm going to refer to a couple of phrases in the Boy Scout Oath. Uh, it starts out, I will do my duty to God. I think it's intentional that God is placed at the very beginning of the Boy Scout Oath. And uh, we are excited about having an opportunity to be the salt and enhance the life of those people that seek to participate in our troop um, and that we run across as we are doing other things. The next part I want to talk about is the, the oath goes on to say that we will help other people at all times. Um, and uh, Boy Scouts teaches selflessness. Uh, we had an opportunity uh, with Butch Paschal and, and uh, uh, Gretchen and Bobby Costner to, to work on the great project that you all did for the, uh, to, to distribute the batteries from SAFT uh, to the firefighters recently. Uh, and we were very pleased to, to participate in that. And we're excited about partnering with the church to do things of that nature in the future. And lastly, I would say that, you know, uh, Scouts teaches practical life skills, but more importantly, even in my opinion, having been through it, I wouldn't have been able to appreciate this when I was going through it. It, it gives you, it gives Boy Scouts, I think, the confidence to approach anything uh, that's in front of them in life. You know, and you do that by learning skills like how to put up a tent. As a parent and a coach, you know, I'm always wondering, well, you know, how can I get my kids to learn this? How can I get them to figure this out and most of the time that involves me having to dream up some sort of a consequence uh, or motivation. It's nice in scouting to have natural consequences like um, pending darkness that you better get your tent set up quickly uh, or you'll be doing it in the dark, cold, rain, things of that nature where I don't really have to worry about it. But the boys learn to, they learn those skills and they learn to have the confidence that they can do them uh, themselves and I just think that's a tremendous skill that really benefits them later in life. So we're excited about what's happening. We're excited about our Cubs back, Cub Pack, um, led by Benita and Wayne Loman, and also Regina Hunt. Um, we're so thankful for the work they're doing with the Cubs, and uh, we're excited about it, and we hope that you will encourage the boys that you know to come and participate. Thanks.
our time of pastoral concerns, I have a number of them to share with you this week. Barbara caught her hand, Jim's wife. Jim is here with us this morning, but Barbara had gone for a um, heart catheterization this week and is scheduled now for surgery, open heart surgery on Tuesday. So we keep Barbara in our prayers, as well as Jim, as he stands by and offers his love and encouragement to her as she recovers. An update on Ken and Janine Bumgarner. Ken had done very well by Thursday. He was off of all respirators, etc. But by Friday morning, back on the respirator. And uh, Janine had broken her patella, the kneecap bone. So uh, she is also struggling, but they do have the support of their children with them right now. And so we keep them both in our prayers as they continue to try to regain strength. Ken has been in the hospital now over 50 days. Lib Caruso uh, is with us this morning. Lib is uh, scheduled to see a neurologist about a small tumor in, in her brain, and so the neurologist will meet with her and develop a plan of addressing that as well. Sawyer Braswell and Casey is with us, his father. Sawyer uh, came through his surgery to reconnect the, the colon. Um, he is a newborn, and so this was um, an important surgery for him to go through, but he came home on Friday and is doing well. We want to remember Lloyd Ray Burris, who also had a heart catheterization this week, and at a future date will probably be scheduled for some surgery for that. And his and Doris's daughter, Marie Woods, who was scheduled for surgery this Thursday to address uh, ovarian cancer that she is struggling with. We also want to remember the family of Will Whetstone. Uh, Will Whetstone was the young man who pulled a gun on police in, in Hickory this past week and lost his life as a result of that. His father David and mother Debbie. Father David is a dentist in Morganton and is known by many in this church and the grief that they are going through this is the second son now that has, has died because of drug-related uh, problems. And so we keep the, the Whetstones, David and Debbie, in our prayers as they grieve this great loss. Are there any others that we should mention and lift up to God uh, at this time? Let us turn to God in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we take time to stop from all the busyness, the rush, the <coughs> frantic pace, and the urgent voices that are clamoring for attention in this world to listen to you. To be in relationship with you through our prayer life so that we may be <coughs> share with you what our concerns are, but also to be in connection with you in that we receive your peace and your inner voice that speaks within each of our hearts. We pray and we lift to you, Lord, many pastoral concerns this week out of this congregation and out of people we know that surround the life of this church. For those who have lost loved ones, particularly the Whetstones, we ask your comforting peace in a difficult time when there is nothing that makes sense for the Whetstone family. We ask your peace and your wisdom to guide them. For those who are going through times of surgery, for Barbara and for Marie Woods, and possibly later for Lori Ray, we ask that you bring them your assurance of your, your presence that you work through the surgeon's hands as they go through their surgeries so that they will be strengthened to wholeness once again and will be able to live the joy of their lives with their family and loved ones. We thank you, Lord, for successful surgery for Sawyer. We ask you also to be with Lib this week as she goes to her neurologist to find out the treatment plan for her. Heavenly Father, we also lift up this world where there is tension and turmoil, where there is divisiveness, and where 
there is great unrest in this world. We ask, O oh Lord, for your peace to reign supreme throughout this world, throughout this land, and in our local community. Guide and direct us as we seek to be agents of your light, agents of being salt in this world. Help us to know what that means, and help us to be faithful to you as we share that which we have received in Christ, that which we share with each other, that which empowers us with courage and hope and a sense of joy even in the core of our lives amidst all the turmoils. So we offer this prayer in gratitude in the one who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come to the reading of God's holy word. Let us turn to God first in prayer. Open us anew, O God, to the power of your spirit. Show us light that we too may be light. Strengthen us with salt that we may help to preserve and give flavor to life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing this day with a series that we started last Sunday on the Beatitudes and particularly the Sermon on the Mount. We covered the Beatitudes last week. This Sunday we start with the 13th verse of chapter 5 in Matthew. And Jesus continues in this sermon. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light 
to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that you may see, they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. So, scouts, have you ever been in the dark by yourself and gotten really scared and were about to lose all hope when suddenly a light appeared to help you steer you back to safety and to increase your sense of security. I was 13 years old at the time and had in, been in scouts for a full year. Our troop was on an overnight camp out in late February, a trip that had been planned for weeks, but we did not plan on the weather being wet and rainy. However, we were prepared. Our objective was to hike five miles that evening after school and to make camp at a lean-to in the Appalachian Trail where we would spend the night at a good drinking water site and a large enough campsite for a whole troop of boys. <coughs> the scoutmaster, though, was late in arriving at the church because his work kept him there a little longer. So we set out a full hour behind schedule. With the clouds and the rain, it meant we would probably hike for at least two full hours in the dark. In those days, there was no such thing as a warm, lightweight sleeping bag, at least not in my price range. About three quarters of the way into the hike, my sleeping bag, which was big and bulky, came undone on my back, and I carried it like I have this stole on right now. I had it draped around and hanging down both sides of my legs, getting wet with every step I took. I began to fall behind the other scouts, and I followed their lights as closely as I could as they kept getting a little further ahead of me. I felt miserable. I was getting cold and scared. The prospect of not keeping up. And I kept yelling, I'm coming guys, I'll be there. Just at the point when I was getting very discouraged, tired and scared, I came to the top of a ridge overlooking the campsite which was several hundred yards down below where I was, and at that site, the assistant scoutmaster had gone on ahead and had started a campfire and had actually prepared a hot meal for us once we got there. From the ridge top, the sight of the campfire below was most welcome. It took away my fears and gave me a much needed extra boost of energy so that I was the, the last one to straggle into the camp a good 200 yards behind everyone else. That would not happen today in scouting because the scoutmaster or some adult would be the last one. I didn't have that luxury. I know from first hand that a child alone in the dark on a mountain trail, a camp fire light shining in the cold, wet winter darkness was a beacon of salvation for me. A light in the darkness can fill one with hope and direction and renewed energy in their faith. From the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus preached, you're the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket but on a lampstand so that it gives light to all of the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven, Jesus says. But who is he speaking to? That's important for us to ask this day. Last week, we did start the Sermon on the Mount series with a focus on the Beatitudes, 
And this Sunday, we study the second part of the sermon, which, which is the ethical part of the sermon, which Jesus preached to the crowds, which included the political and religious leaders and the common folks who had gathered all together to hear him preach. As I studied for this sermon, I came to realize the true power of these words cannot fully be understood without knowing the political and religious context in the time of Jesus. Jesus' intended audience was the entire nation of Israel. So this sermon is not a generalized sermon on ethical principles for us as individuals to follow. He had something even deeper than that in mind when he was presenting his sermon. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount defines his challenge to all of Israel, laid out in the midst of a heated debate going on at the time between powerful rival groups in Israel concerning what political and religious course of action to take during the Roman occupation. For 500 years, Israel had been occupied, first by the Persians, then by the Greeks, but the most oppressive and powerful force at work at that time were the Romans. And the Romans, even the people of Israel, had long since returned to their homeland from exile. They still were controlled by heavy taxation and a tight-fisted reign of the Roman Empire. This led to an array of theological questions and differing opinions at work in the life of Israel. What does God want us to do, and how are we to respond? Where is God when all the people are oppressed? How can it be that Jerusalem is called to be God's holy city when we're being desecrated by the presence of Romans in our temple? These different factions, there are four of them within Judaism, and they developed four different responses. And Jesus is addressing those four groups as well as the common folk. And here's what happens. The Sadducees, which was the ruling class of the Jews, took the approach of collaborating with the Romans, getting in their back pocket, if you will, working to try to figure out, now we can make things just a little bit easier for Israel if we have these rulers on our side, but they also made themselves rich in the process, the Sadducees. How can you be salt if you have sold out to the Romans? How can you be salt if you are collaborating with the powers that be? The Pharisees generally emphasized attention to the purity laws. The private study of scripture and the ancient rituals of temple worship essentially advocating for withdrawal from the evil Roman presence and retreating in a ritualized but very private relationship with God at the expense of them continually judging others and causing them to be feared by the people rather than encouraged. The Jewish zealots took a more radical approach. They believed that the infidel Roman enemy must be destroyed, and they believed and prepared for an uprising that would overthrow the Roman rule. Then finally, the Essenes physically withdrew from the society altogether establishing separate enclaves of faithfulness in desert communities, far from the reach of the Roman influence. This then is that context, the political and religious context, and the backdrop through which we hear Jesus' challenge to each one of those four groups, but also an encouragement to the common folk. Jesus says, Israel, you're not called to be any of these responses to Roman rule. You're called to be salt and light. Speaking to all of Israel, he preaches a sermon on the mount, and we remember from last week, he encourages gentle humility with others, 
keeping our focus on the will of God, striving for God's righteousness in our daily lives, being peacemakers. And if by following me you're persecuted, then you will inherit the kingdom of heaven, he says, to all of Israel, but perhaps with a particular challenge to the collaborating Sadducees who were wealthy and powerful, cooperating with the Romans, increasing their oppressive leadership, he says, you are salt. You must remain distinct. If you are in the back pocket of the Romans, you cannot be salt or light to this world. That's a lesson we need to remember this week. This past week with the suggestion that churches and ministers can align with one particular party. Imagine if I were to tell you, you've got a, one minister in this community four or five years ago said, you cannot be a Christian and be a Democrat. They lost members. Imagine if we were to say, in order for us to be Christian, we've got to be presenting this party line thinking, is that not collaboration with Rome? something to be very, very alarmed about and concerned about. Being salt preserves the proper focus on the will of God for human life and encourages spiritual growth. To correct our behaviors, to discover the essence of what it means to be a child of God for human life. And you Pharisees, you are called and are get caught up into directing God's people to withdraw into your own spirituality at the expense of any relationship with anyone else. Yes, spirituality is important. But if you end up judging other people as being lesser than you, then you are not salt. And you are not light. He speaks with an eye towards the zealots whose goal was to kill and destroy the Roman presence in Israel. And he says, you're the light of the world. Light brings life, hope, and peace in a troubled world. But you zealots, with all your calls for anarchy and death to the Romans, you're leading the people of God into darkness and complete social destruction. And it will be your undoing, zealots. By calling Israel to be light to the world, Jesus calls into question any political stand that violates the principles of God's peace and righteous treatment of other people, even the treatment of one's own enemies. And you Essenes, you cannot withdraw from the world into a life of isolationism and still be a shining beacon of hope on a hill God has called all of Israel to be. You Essenes hear this. No one, after lighting the lamp of faith, puts it under a bushel basket, but places that lamp light on the lampstand, and it gives light to the whole house of Israel. All of Israel, and indeed all the world. Now do you see the power at work in Jesus' sermon? when he's addressing those four groups within the society that are clamoring for the attention of the people and encouraging a particular action or response to the Romans, do we not see similar threats and threads at work in our society today? And it's important for us to understand what it means to be salt and light in that context. That is what we're called to do and to be, as Jesus points out, our God-given identity to be a light to the nations. He challenges those who want to use violence or collaboration or isolationism or religious withdrawal as an ethical response to the call to be God's people. In so doing, each of these groups in Jesus' day ignore the needs of the common folk. They ignore basic human interaction of compassion. 
They ignore the importance of humility in their own hearts. Jesus' sermon applies to today just as it did back then. For if we have lost our saltness, if we have lost our light, and people don't see the light and love of Christ at work in each of us, then what good are we? We've lost the taste of saltness. We are not different from anything else. This very point ties the beatitude of last week with the primary focus of this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, and it is, in essence, a theology of discipleship. And it can be summarized as follows. For all who seek to follow him, we are called to be a life centered on the human qualities of compassion, humility, guided by hope. That's the message of the Beatitudes. It's certainly continuation of the message here in the next part of the Sermon on the Mount. If we look at verse 17 through 20, Jesus does direct most of his criticism against the scribes and the Pharisees because these are the educated Jewish leadership who were called to lead God's people spiritually through the word of God in its application in their lives. But it got changed into this notion of 613 purity laws that had to be followed with rigid attention they lost the joy. They lost the center of their focus of being light and salt. Jesus turns the world of Israel upside down in order to show the whole nation and most particularly the religious leaders the true values of God. To redefine the nature of the relationship with God and humanity that God desires. Our calling as Christians, as disciples of Jesus. The forces of this world are constantly at work trying their best to distort what a faithful response to God is. It is imperative that we know what a faithful response to God is. Imperative. Otherwise, we lose our identity. We lose what we're good at, caring about others, pointing to redemption, salvation, the promises of God for us all, sharing that love when people go through suffering and despair, and hearing the cries of humanity beyond our doors. That's what we're good at. That's the essence of who we are. This is a light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand and join with me. If you'll look in your hymnal at page 37, the section number two on the brief statement of faith is what we will share together. Please stand. We're reading section number two, which starts, We Trust in Jesus Christ. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor, release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raises this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. Please be seated. Let us offer our gifts of love and gratitude 
For God has called us to be light and salt in the world.
this world with confidence. For God has empowered you to be light and salt, and in so doing you bring life where there is darkness. You bring hope where there is a sense of loss and remorse. You bring restoration where there is brokenness. Go into this world now and be salt and light. And may the God who brought again from the dead our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ equip you with everything good, that you may do what is pleasing in God's sight. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>